Hello and welcome to another video review. This is Castle of the Winds for PC, specifically Windows 3.1, which is actually very important if you're trying to get this thing running on modern operating systems, which is something I'll explain a bit more later on in the video. This is a roguelike dungeon crawler developed by SadaSoft and published by Epic Mega Games back in 1993 for Windows 3.1 in two parts. The first part, A Question of Vengeance, was released as shareware, meaning that you could distribute it for free, and the second part, Lift Seer's Bane, was actually sold as a commercial product. And while it's a more or less forgotten game these days, it was generally pretty well liked back in its day, and it's gotten something of a cult following over the years. Eventually, Rick Sada, the developer of the game, ended up making it freeware and just released it to the general public to freely download to your heart's content, and more recently that's actually been something of a problem, because while the freeware download is still readily available, you have to keep in mind that the game is a 16-bit application that was developed for Windows 3.1. It's just not going to work on 64-bit Windows at all, and on 32-bit Windows it was a bit of a chore to get running in the later days of 32-bit. That's where, before I even get into the review proper here, I have to mention how you can actually get this up and running on a modern operating system, which is actually extremely easy these days days thanks to Wind VDM. It's a program specifically designed to run 16-bit applications on 64-bit Windows, especially Windows 10, and the process for it is as easy as dragging the executable that you're trying to run onto the executable for Wind VDM, or using the Wind VDM GUI executable and selecting the EXE from that. That said, Wind VDM is not a perfect solution. It's not a finished program yet, so there are some compatibility issues here and there depending on which program you're trying to run, and while Castle of the Winds mostly works fine, occasionally it will still crash, and you do also have the problem of having to constantly select where it's actually saving the save files to, but it's not really anything that's not manageable. And as an added bonus, as you can no doubt tell from the video footage, you can expand the window size to whatever you want, because Castle of the Winds originally ran in windowed mode only, and thus you could always expand the window size to whatever you want. It's just that back in the Windows 3.1, one day's monitor sizes were usually about 640 by 480 or so. But I'm digressing here. Let's go ahead and actually start delving into the game proper and see exactly how it is as a game from its time period and of course how well it's held up over the years. Now like always we're going to go ahead and start with the presentation but there's actually not a whole lot to talk about here. Since the game is always in windowed mode, the resolution is basically whatever your screen's resolution is or whatever you've decided to expand the window to, that that doesn't really matter because the actual graphics themselves are either just 32 by 32 windows icons that are embedded in the executable or they're just bitmaps included in the executable. There are really no animations of any kind, although it does give the illusion of animations by showing the icons moving across the screen and such, and the game's interface itself is mostly just standard Windows 3.1 GUI. Yeah, this game was never really much of a looker, although to be fair, back then when people were looking into roguelikes, they didn't really care about graphics. Most people were still playing things like NetHack, which barely has anything vaguely resembling graphics. So while in terms of roguelikes, the graphics of this one were of the more advanced variety of the time, you have to keep in mind that in the grand scheme of video games, this was actually looking pretty primitive even back then, because this was the same year we got the likes of Doom and Eye of the Beholder 3, Assault on Mithranor, and Lands of Lore, The Throne of Chaos. We had some pretty good-looking games back then that actually still hold up really well to this day, and unfortunately the graphics in this one just don't hold up at all. But things get worse for the presentation once you start to look into the sound and you realize there isn't any. There is absolutely no sound in this game at all. No music, no sound effects, no voice, nothing. Even though the actual box for the game itself does say that it has sound. So I'm not entirely sure what happened with the miscommunication between the actual development team and the marketing department there, but suffice to say, the presentation in this just does not hold up very well at all. But one thing it actually does have going for it is that it is extremely functional. Sure, it's not pretty to look at, but the interface itself is extremely easy to work with and surprisingly customizable. You can quickly and easily swap things out of all the quick slots, and when you go into your inventory, you can have a bunch of different containers open open all at once for quick and easy inventory management. It's actually legitimately surprising just how good the interface in this is, considering that back when this released, the entire concept of a mouse-driven GUI was still pretty new, and they were still trying to figure out exactly how to make it work. So you definitely have to give them credit for that. 
But here's the thing, as poorly as most of the presentation holds up, it's not really what matters here. What really matters are the story and the gameplay. And this game doesn't really have all that much of a story. I mean, it is a roguelike dungeon crawler, so it is primarily a gameplay-driven title, but you do have moments where it will give you some additional story. The basic idea is that your character starts out living in a hamlet with their godparents, and one day the farm is ransacked and their godparents are killed, and so your character sets forth into the nearby abandoned mine in order to mete out bloody vengeance. Once you've carved your way through most of the abandoned mine, you end up finding a scrap of parchment that tells you your godparents were actually killed on someone's orders and not just in some random raid. This immediately puts your character in I've got a bad feeling about this mode, and you end up making your way back to the hamlet only to find that it has been completely destroyed. Seeing that there's nothing left for them there, your character ends up making their way to the village of Bjarnarhaven, which has a fortress nearby that you ultimately need to clear out in order to mete out your bloody vengeance upon those who are responsible for killing your godparents. And of course, after carving your way through the fortress, you end up finding an item that, once you activate it, will end up transporting you to the town of Crossroads. This is where you would end up saving your game, because you had ultimately finished part one, and you would be able to import that save into part two, Lithran Seer's Bane. The story from there picks up in the town of Crossroads, which is near the so-called Castle of the Winds, where the player character will ultimately meet one of their ancestors who tells them about the reasons things are the way they are and what they ultimately have to do to resolve the whole situation. And obviously, that involves more dungeon crawling. So the entire game is centered around its mechanics more than anything else, and the story is really just a flimsy excuse to hold the entire game together. It is loosely based on Norse mythology, but it doesn't really go too heavily into that, and that's really just more some basic context as to what's going on more than anything else. So what exactly is the gameplay loop of Castle of the Winds? Well, you go around in a tile-based dungeon crawler where everything is turn-based. And by that I mean whenever you move or take an action, all of the monsters move and take actions along with you. So if they're close enough, then they might either shoot arrows at you or cast spells at you. Or if they're really close to you, they might try to attack you in melee. So you have to be careful about what you're doing whenever monsters are around. Because every single thing you do is an action, and that will basically take up your entire turn. So you can either move, or you can cast a spell, or you can attack an enemy in melee or you can perform an action like open a door, or mess around with your inventory. And since most things in the game are up to a roll of the dice, you need to be very careful with what you're doing, make sure you've made all the necessary preparations before you go into things, otherwise chances are you're going to meet your doom. Which means that the mantra of the game is save early and save often. There are no checkpoints or auto saves or anything of that nature, it's all manual saves only, and while you do have a quick save button, that only saves to the file that you have most recently edited. Admittedly, this means you can cheese the mechanics a bit, but to be fair, the game is out to get you from the very beginning, so you basically need every single edge you can get. After all, you're dealing with a variety of enemies that can do things from just simply damage you, to poison you, which will continue to do damage until the poison is neutralized, or enemies that can inflict stat drains on you, which will actually reduce your stats, and even enemies that can steal your money and items. On top of that, the dungeons are absolutely full of deadly traps that you'll be needing to constantly search for and disarm, and in a lot of cases you'll just end up blundering right into them. That said, while the game is fairly difficult at times, it is not unfair in its difficulty. I mean, sure, a lot of the times the dice rolls will just not be in your favor, but you can always reload and try it again and the dice rolls might be more favorable. Aside from that, the dungeons themselves will have plenty of loot that you can acquire, and you can either sell it back in town or equip it if it's better than what you have, or if there's something in particular you really like out of what you found, and you'll also get access to a wide variety of spell books that you can use to learn new spells, or scrolls that you can use to instantly cast a spell, which in turn of course consumes the scroll, so you have to be careful about how you use those, and then of course the game will also give you a bunch of potions that you can use for varying effects, most of which relate to healing. You'll also find outright equipment like additional melee weapons, or shields, or armor, or helmets, or whatever the case may be that are also scattered around the dungeons, and while you do have to be especially careful with those because some of them are actually 
automatically cursed, meaning that if you decide to equip them, then not only will it debuff a lot of your stats, but it will also be impossible to remove it until you actually use the remove curse spell on it. You do have access to an identify spell, which will allow you to identify all the various items that you find around the dungeon and determine whether they're normal, cursed, or outright enchanted, in which case you'll be getting a pretty significant boost to your stats or your attack value or whatever the case may be, depending on which item it is. And as a bit of an added bonus in that regard, you actually can identify scrolls and potions, and those will actually identify every single instance of that same exact type of scroll or potion throughout the rest of the game. So for example, if you identify one of the useless potions, which is the distillation of water, then any additional distillation of water that you will ever find throughout the rest of the game is automatically identified without you having to cast that spell again. And the same will be true for any potion that you identify. So for example, if you do a draft of detect monsters, every single draft of detect monsters will be immediately recognizable to you. Or if you identify, say, a scroll of create monster, then every single scroll of create monster will immediately be recognizable to you once you find one. And while the identify spell is one of the earlier ones you'll have in the game's progression, you may not necessarily want to pick it first because there might be other spells you really want. So if you still want to identify things, you can always take items back to town and go to one of the sages that is available in any of the towns, and they will be able to identify your items for a fee. Obviously, costs in that regard are going to add up over time, so you'll probably end up getting the identify spell pretty early on, and you'll be able to use it to your heart's content. This is something you do have to be careful with, however, because it does use two mana, which early on in the game is a pretty significant problem because you have a very limited amount of mana. And the reason this is a problem is because the main way you're going to have to restore your mana is actually to sleep. You can rest to restore your hit points, in which case you're basically fully aware and it doesn't take all that long, but in the case of sleeping, you can get interrupted quite easily, and if you get interrupted by particularly powerful monsters, then you're basically up shit creek without a paddle. So once again, the classic mantra comes into sharp focus. Save early, and save often. If you're about to do something stupid, or about to do something that could potentially be very dangerous, make sure you've saved your game first, because chances are, you're gonna have your sleep interrupted by some horribly nasty monster that is very resistant to all of your physical attacks, and you're not gonna have enough mana to be able to cast spells at it. Now, it is worth noting that in an emergency, you can actually cast spells without mana. The thing is that I would only recommend doing that if you have absolutely no other choice, because if you cast spells without mana, it starts to take hit points instead. But if an enemy has backed you into a corner because they interrupted your sleep and you can't figure out a way to get away from them without casting a spell, then you might just end up having to do that. The game can occasionally get pretty relentless in that regard, especially once you get to the point where enemies can start attacking you from a distance, and when you start running into enemies that are especially powerful that can take you down in only a couple of hits. But to be fair, that was actually pretty typical for the era. A lot of role-playing games and dungeon crawlers and such were just absolutely relentless on the difficulty back then, and it was just something that you had to deal with. This was even more so the case with roguelikes, because they generally had permadeath, and so if you ended up dying, you lost that character permanently and had to start the entire game all over again. That's not the case with Castle of the Winds, obviously you can just reload your save and keep going, so it's at least more forgiving than that, but it's certainly on par with a lot of the other dungeon crawlers and role-playing games of the era in terms of difficulty. This, of course, means that modern gamers are going to have a bit of a hard time getting adjusted to the difficulty because it really is something from a different era. Most games these days are frankly too easy, and if you go back to something like this, even the easy mode is more what you would consider, say, a medium or even slightly hard difficulty in a more modern game. But considering that the game actually has its manual built into to the game and you can just go into the help menu at any time and pull up information on monsters, items, what equipment is better than what other equipment, all that sort of thing, and the interface itself is just so accessible, Castle of the Winds actually ends up being a supremely playable game even to this day. It is very easy to pick up and play even if you have basically no experience with dungeon crawlers or roguelikes at all. You might find some difficulty if your keyboard doesn't have a number pad on it because the movement controls were actually designed around the number pad and being able to press 7, 9, 1, or 3 to move diagonally. And the alternative to that, if you're not using the number pad, is the arrow keys for up, down, left, and right, and then home, page up, end, and page down for the diagonal movements. But it's something you can still get used to, and it's not really that big of a deal considering the game is turn-based. So the game's certainly not without its problems. I mean, like I said, the controls take a bit of getting 
used to. The game can be kind of difficult at times. The story is definitely nothing to write home about, and the gameplay itself can be a bit repetitive, but the game lends itself very well to both long and short play sessions. It's not especially long, so it certainly doesn't wear out its welcome. The dungeon randomization does give it a bit of replay value, and more importantly, it's just so easy to pick up and play that all the problems it does have are so minimal that they're really not problems at all. They're just mild drawbacks that you might occasionally notice, but don't really get in the way. And as such, I can very easily recommend giving Castle the Winds a try, especially now that it's freeware. Even back when it wasn't freeware, it was still worth playing if you liked this particular genre. But now that it is freeware, and has been for quite some time in fact, there's not really much reason not to give Castle the Winds a try. And now that Wine VDM is available, it's pretty easy to get this thing up and running on 64-bit Windows, even though there are a few compatibility issues here and there. So I'd say even if you aren't necessarily a fan of old-school dungeon crawlers or roguelikes, you should still give Castle the Winds a try. You might find that it's actually something that you were really interested in, and it was just the accessibility problems that a lot of those older games had that were putting you off in the first place. And obviously, if you're already a fan of roguelikes or dungeon crawlers, then definitely give it a try, because it's right up your alley to begin with. But if you're a very impatient person, and you can't really deal with the game actually having any sort of difficulty about it, then this may not necessarily be the game for you. Regardless, if you are interested in giving the game a try, I will have links in the video description to where you can pick up both the game itself and WineVDM so you can get it running on modern Windows. Thanks for watching, and if you like the kind of videos I make, then please consider supporting the channel on Patreon. Every single cent from that goes directly back into the channel, whether that be getting additional games for review, or hardware for recording, or whatever the case may be. If you can't afford to, or don't want to, that's perfectly fine, I understand, but the option is there if you're interested. Thank you all again for watching, and I'll see you all in later videos.